And we're back, everyone. This is Radio Free Market, and uh, we're here with Dr. Thomas Woods. And, Tom, we were talking just before the break about how we got here. And um, you list these three different uh, major misinterpretations and misapplications in the Constitution, uh, the General Welfare Clause, Commerce Clause, and Necessary and Proper Clause. Let's approach this in an ABC manner and first tell our listeners uh, about this General Welfare Clause and what it was supposed to mean. The General Welfare Clause, I'll, I'll sort of give away the punchline, has today been used, it's usually used by people just sort of man on the street way, uh, in, in the following way, that the federal government can do whatever it thinks will redound to the benefit of the people. That's what they think the General Welfare Clause means, and so if there's anything that they want done, then they say, well, that's for the general welfare, so of course the federal government can do it. Okay, well, what, what, did, what did it really mean? Well, Madison himself said repeatedly, and I mean repeatedly and throughout his career, and, and given how inconsistent Madison could be, this, it's very significant how consistent he was on the general welfare clause. His argument was, look at the structure of the Constitution. In Article One, Section 8, we list the powers of the federal government. Now, if the federal government really had the power to do anything that would be for the benefit of the people, whatever is for the benefit of the people. We would not then say, okay, now here are 17 specific things. We, we wouldn't do that. It, it makes no sense. General welfare simply meant that when the federal government is carrying out its delegated powers, it must carry out those powers with an eye to the general welfare of the whole country, not for the enriching of one part at the expense of another. So in other words, the General Welfare Clause does not grant the federal government an additional broad, unspecified reservoir of powers. It doesn't grant the federal government any additional powers whatsoever. It simply says, when you are exercising the powers we did grant you, you should always do it thinking about the general welfare of the country as a whole. How did the Commerce Clause get morphed? Oh, yeah. Now, the Commerce Clause, this is their favorite one. This is their all-time favorite. The Constitution grants the Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce. Now, the, initially, this seems to have been understood, or Madison understood it, as primarily a negative power to prevent the states from obstructing the free flow of commerce. So commerce is to be made regular so that it flows freely as a stream throughout the country without artificial barriers being being put up in, in, uh, in its place. So in practice and with the passage of time, this clause began to mean that, well, if anything affects interstate commerce, then the federal government can regulate that. So it is a positive power to regulate. It got pretty regulate. ridiculous. And then it became ridiculous because, of course, anything, if you stretch it absurdly enough, can be said to regulate interstate commerce. So the federal government has basically thought, well, if we can regulate interstate commerce, we can regulate everything if we somehow define everything as being interstate commerce. So, so let's, the, let's uh, ask you to uh, just outline in very brief uh, this one 1942 case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had that in mind in particular. Yeah. Uh, this is the Wickard versus Filburn case. Now, here's a farmer, and he is contesting the argument that the federal government can regulate the amount of acreage he can bring in under cultivation uh, on the grounds that uh, he says, look, I, I'm growing wheat to consume myself and my family and my livestock. We're, we're going to consume this wheat. And so the wheat hasn't traveled anywhere. It's in no way part of interstate commerce. I'm growing it here. I'm consuming it here. That's the end. So how can you possibly regulate that? That's obviously not interstate commerce. And the federal government said, oh, no, no, no. We beg to differ. It is interstate commerce. And here's how. What if you didn't grow that wheat? May, then maybe you might have purchased your wheat from another state. Oh so by growing it, you are abstaining from engaging in interstate commerce and thereby indirectly affecting it. So, I mean, this is absurd, right? This yeah, obviously is absurd. So it just goes to show they will define it absurdly so that they can justify regulating everything. And then the, the finally, after decades and decades and decades of letting the federal government get away with this, the great protector of our liberties, the Supreme Court, that will strike everything down if it's unconstitutional, decades and decades and decades of this nonsense, finally – we get one case in 1995, the so-called Lopez case, U.S. versus Lopez, that finally the court puts its foot down. That involved the Gun-Free School Zones Act of 1990, which said, you know, you can't bring a gun within X number of feet of a school. 
Now, there were already 40 states with a law like this on the books, so it hardly seemed necessary anyway, but the argument there was, well, where does the federal government get the authority to interfere with a matter like this? This clearly seems like a state matter. Like, where does it get this power? And the federal government's argument, I mean, this is just, you can't believe this. You think, surely I'm making this up. The federal government's argument was, no, 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 this affects interstate commerce, because if there's the possibility that there might be a gun in a school zone, then the students are, are going to be nervous about that. And if they're nervous, well, how are they going to learn? And if they don't learn as much, they're going to be ignorant. And if they're ignorant, how can they produce? They won't be able to produce as much. And if they don't produce as much, then interstate commerce will be reduced. And therefore, this affects interstate commerce. And, and, and the, the, the court said, you know, we've basically been pretty reasonable up to, over the years. We've been pretty indulgent with you, you people. But this is just stupid. I mean, and it took, that, it took that many years for them finally to say, all right, this is just ridiculous. Yeah, nearly 60 years, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about the necessary and proper clause, which I like to call the elastic clause. Yeah, this is, yeah. This is what our social studies teachers tell us, that uh, you know, if, if you weren't convinced by the other two clauses I mentioned, then I've always, this is my ace in the hole, necessary and proper. This covers it all. Necessary and proper clause says the federal uh, government has the power to exercise those powers that are necessary and proper to carry into execution the delegated power. So in other words, to make this simpler, simply means that, or this is the original intention anyway, simply means that if the federal government has the power to build needful buildings, which indeed is one of its powers, then by implication it would have the power to purchase lumber to build the building. I mean, it just means that whatever powers you need to carry out the ones we've given you, then naturally you would have those as well. So, so it, it doesn't it an mean... an act of Congress to just go buy lumber... Or exactly. Buy it wouldn't, yeah, whatever. exactly. This would be understood to be subsumed under the powers of Article 1, Section 8. So it's a very commonsensical notion. It, it does not mean the federal government, again, is granted an unspecified additional array of powers. No. Any powers exercised under the Necessary and Proper Clause have to be tied clearly to a delegated power. Well, this... Again, this clause is now being stretched to imply that federal government can pretty much do anything it thinks might be convenient. And, of course, it thinks everything is convenient. But, no, it says necessary, necessary and proper. Well, what's very revealing is that Alexander Hamilton probably was the guy who most favored a strong central government, broad construction of the Constitution. And even he said the Constitution would be exactly the same if we obliterated the necessary and proper clause, if we took it right out, it would not affect the Constitution at all. It's just there as a note of clarification. So even he says this, that it, it, it's just there to clarify. It doesn't give them any additional powers. The Constitution would be exactly the same if it had never been included. 